I'm going to draw on the experience of about 2,000 enterprises like yourselves over the last 10 years, pulling in the experience of about 600,000 end users that have given us some of the insights into the challenges they faced as they try to take their known world, which was sitting on the wired LAN with headquarters organization applications, and trying to take those out in the field, and have a look at about a dozen issues. Um, I've tried to pick the top 12 that they hit as they, as they went across there. We've heard this morning of the importance of mobility to organizations, and I'm sure we will over the next two days, the drive for more applications to get out there, the challenge of connectivity gaps and poor coverage, trying to contain costs by exploiting Wi-Fi whenever possible, and then hitting the brick wall of the security guys that say, heck no, you can't do that. We need to lock the devices down. And all of it trying to chase return on investment and bringing down total cost of ownership for those organizations. As I looked at those challenges, it reminded me of something I found from my kids in the attic the other day, a little labyrinth game where the objective is obviously get that little ball through all the labyrinth and try and see if you can get it out the bottom. And I thought those challenges are a little bit like this game. It's almost impossible to navigate successfully through on a mobility deployment and getting that issue at the bottom. I'm going to look at this with three business contexts as mind. I'm going to look at some business operations issues. I'm going to look at some issues from service delivery perspective. But most importantly, and looking at these drivers we've seen previously, I'm going to look at the initial and most important pitfall for any mobile project that rolls out. And that's if you can't get user acceptance, you might as well quit today. Because if you make it difficult to do the job, they will find a way around whatever obstacle you put in their way, and they'll get inventive. And the more difficult you make it, the more cumbersome you make it, the more inventive they're going to get. So you'll get end-user boycott, which is going to kill your project stone dead. Um, I've used the phrase there, during your project sales process, you create this warm expectation of what they're going to get, and then you're rolled out, and suddenly they hit the cold reality of what it was like when they get out of the lab environment, and they're in a poor coverage area with few cell towers sitting far away from a help desk. Um, a simple philosophy that our customers have taught us is nothing should get in the way of the task. Don't distract the person from the job they're trying to do. Whatever you've got to impose on the device or the process, make it transparent. Just make it easy for those users to do it right. For the guys at the back, they won't be able to see this because there's heads in the way but I'm quoting an operations director from one of our customers, the best solution, one that needs minimal user intervention and makes the underlying technology as transparent as possible. It's got to be like the in-office experience. If I can achieve a mobile rollout that doesn't require my end user to learn anything or to modify their behavior or to do anything other than accept the obvious, and it's not a difficult intellectual leap, mobile is slower than the office LAN. They'll accept that, but for their behaviors, make it the same. For us, the single and biggest challenge to a project, and that goes quite smoothly across to the second issue um, as a major challenge, is if you can't make the physics of wireless that, that we have to live with, the fact that there are coverage gaps, that wireless does get awfully slow, that you want to use different wireless types, if you can't make that transparent to the end user, and almost more importantly, transparent to the application. I want my application to survive when the coverage drops. If I'm halfway through filling a form in, I should be able to survive that coverage gap and just carry on without losing any data when coverage comes back again. And if I'm walking in a hospital and I'm going from one wireless subnet to the other as I go from access point to access point, don't make me stop in my tracks re-authenticate, re-log on, bring up my VPN again, fire up the application, re-enter the data. Or if you've got a Windows mobile device, quite often you've got to pull out that little stick, shove it out the back, and start your day all over again because that little device just froze in its tracks. Try and remove that stuff. Hide everything from the end user. Let them authenticate the way they do in the office today. Let them use the applications the way they do in the office today. Let them go through their day with the business stuff they have to do. I've got a mobile device, I need to suspend and resume. I don't want to kill the application when I suspend and resume. 
have an infrastructure that makes that appear to be alive and when I come out because I'm saving battery life, just carry on from where I was, where I was previously. Effectively, if you can achieve, imagine a rubber wireless LAN cable or a rubber LAN cable that runs to your central network. That's how it should feel to the application, that's how it should feel to the end user, and that's how it should feel to the infrastructure that supports it. Roam seamlessly and, and wirelessly, a major challenge for rolling out. We've already heard this morning, and I'm on to number three, and I'm scampering through these fast because I know I'm hard against the time deadline. Um, you start off maybe with task scheduling and job management, rolling out your field force, and they start getting a taste for mobile. And very quickly, the business starts giving you pressure that, hang on, I want some real-time processing. I happen to have this person sitting in front of the customer. I want them to have access to the inventory database. I want them to have real-time access to the ERP system. And I need to be able to roll those systems out. And the business doesn't necessarily want the response to be, well, okay, we're going to launch an investigation and we might repurpose this application to do it on web services and maybe the end of 2013 we'll be able to do that. What if you can pull some of that into the infrastructure and take the risk that anything that runs on the LAN, I'm going to try and run that wireless and start building an infrastructure that allows you to take things like your order management, your inventory management, but also some heavier duty applications like your GIS mapping, or maybe even voice and video. Things you'd previously tried to run over your legacy infrastructure. See if you can find a way to get creative and have that stuff work when the infrastructure is very fragile. And these aren't empty promises, by the way. I started off by saying this is based on the feedback from 2,000 real life examples. The issue is those applications weren't designed with fragile wireless in mind. They are going to freeze and crash. They're not going to work well. The challenge is get the right infrastructure, get it so that you don't need to repurpose the application, but also develop it in a way that you can prioritize so that when the network is fragile and you have very little bandwidth available, you can start deciding how you're going to allocate that scarce resource. So critical business functions like, say, job scheduling or call and dispatch are still going to run, but maybe Outlook email will be a little bit slower. So we've gone through user acceptance. We've gone through seamless roaming. We've looked at rolling out more applications. Challenge number four, and we heard hints of that in the previous presentation. I'm looking at my mobile strategy. I want to make more available to the field but I want granular control about who's allowed to do what, when, on what device, at what time of day, for which application, for which user group. You want to, firstly, you want to contain costs. For some people, that's not a big issue because they believe they have unlimited data. For others, the global cellular phone bill is a big issue and they want to keep that capped. But even if you aren't sensitive to the size of your network operator's bill, you want to be able to control access to make sure that you give the right access to the right applications for regulatory reasons. I want to be able to control that you can see these applications when, for instance, you're on an internal Wi-Fi <coughs> access point. But if you're in McDonald's or a coffee shop, I don't want this sensitive application to be visible because somebody might be looking over your shoulder. I don't want to write a rule book that tells people what they're allowed to do when. I want the infrastructure to be sensitive to where it is, what it's doing, and be able to control that automatically according to my own definitions. I want it to be sensitive to the type of network it's on, and I want it to be able to optimize when it is on poorer networks. So I want it to be able to create applications that will run faster than they do today wirelessly. I want to be able to take applications that previously we thought we couldn't roll out and be able to roll them out today with some confidence. Bill hinted at that this morning when he, on one of his slides, um, a cliche, but it's a real one, is if you can't measure, you can't manage. So if you've got a mobile workforce out there, it's not good enough for me to, and I'll use the operator name that one of our speakers used this morning, that I get my Vodafone bill once a month, and it says, that's how many bytes you shipped this month. 
well, gee, that's useful. Um, what I'd really like to know is by user, by device, by application, by network type, by time of day, what's been shipping, and by the way, what sort of issues have been happening out there? So I want to start getting detailed reporting back, useful for management reports, very useful for capa capacity planning, <coughs> but also exceedingly useful to be able to target response and maybe for IT to get proactive and being able to deal with issues before they arise and hit the business. Basically, get some reporting infrastructure that can at a very granular detail level give you feedback on what's happening to your state. And when I'm speaking in a state here, it could be 25 users, it could be 55,000 users, and that sample set that I drew this experience from, the largest customer in there has 55,000 field engineers. Um, if you can turn the lights on to that, you'll start getting some management intelligence out that's going to be vital to tune more closely the way that your operation is running with the way that your business demands and, and strategy would like to see it going. We had another issue that was hinted at a couple of times today. Um, I'm an old IT guy. You can see I'm not a good sales guy. Um, one of the big challenges I had in the old days was I will dictate exactly what device you use and I will make sure that device is to corporate standards and we'll do that by bringing it in out of the field periodically and we'll ensure that it's a so-called gold build. That's not good enough for mobile guys. They can't afford to be without that device at any time. They've got a day's work to do. It should be with them. I want to be able to balance that demand with protecting those vital corporate assets at headquarters. I'm not just worried about the device and the data that might sit on the device. I'm worried about the evil that might bring into my hallowed trusted network centrally because that's picked something up on the wild and it's going to introduce it when it connects to my, to my LAN. Um, so I want to be able to put up that no entry sign and I want to make sure that nobody comes in and steals the wire off my no entry sign when I'm not looking. I want to be in total control of what's in the device. By the way, if you want to see that picture, it's in a coffee shop at Golden Square in London. Um, so here's what I want to do. I want to know that stuff isn't to corporate standards. I can do the stupid thing. I can pop up a message to the end user saying, we are going to lock your device because it's not good enough. Please come into headquarters. Or I can remedy it automatically. I can start picking up that it's wrong. And then with sensitivity, remember the previous slide, I want to be sensitive to whether I'm sitting on cellular or Wi-Fi or on ADSL lines at home and depending on the network type I'm on, then automatically ship down the application. If let's say it's a firewall that's not present or an antivirus that's out of date. And maybe my policy is antivirus signatures, I'll ship over cellular. But the antivirus software, I'm only going to update on the LAN or on ADSL. Have the ability to do that, but don't keep the end user in the dark. Have the ability to communicate with them dynamically in a little, say, a pop-up window and just say, your device is going to be slow for the next 10 minutes. We're updating your antivirus. If you don't run a virus scan in the next two days, we will schedule it automatically after 5 p.m. in the afternoon. So the end user gets informed. The last thing you want to do is trigger help desk calls. The whole drive we're trying to get to is to get away from too many help desk calls. We want to provide enough transparency for the end users that you don't take that flood of trouble tickets and I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but if you looked at the calls that come in from your mobile users today, um, in our experience, a big proportion of those are to do with connectivity, security solutions, VPN profiles, things of that ilk. Sure, the application goes wrong, but when you map it down to why did that application hiccup, it's very often the fact that the link broke or it's too slow or whatever. If you can start ticking the boxes in the first six issues we mentioned, your result should be a significant decline in trouble tickets um, for all the connectivity, security, authentication re reasons. And let's not be too hard on those end users. That signpost in the bottom right-hand corner that, again, the people in the back can't see, when stuff goes wrong for me, I don't know where, when, why, who, what? Is it the device? Is it the network? Is it the application? I had a lovely example last week, listening to a network help desk person speak to a field engineer saying, what Windows socket are you using? 
help me. I can just imagine the guy taking his device saying, don't bother, and that happens so often. You start seeing your help desk calls tail off, not because you've solved the problems, they've just given up. Um, there is no solution from headquarters. I might as well not bother phoning anymore. Try and get an infrastructure that hides the complexity of the connection. You should see a direct correlation in decreased help desk calls. Big deal, what I'm really seeing is increased productivity. Because all those minutes that IT burns up sitting listening to the help desk, that field force is sitting out there talking to you rather than talking to customers who are doing the job they should be doing. Service delivery. Let's look into the IT network operations center. And I don't know if your IT shop looks like a lot of those I go to or into the place where all the spaghetti is lying over the floor. Some places a little neater than others. We spoke of users being or enjoying transparency to the infrastructure. Let's try and allow the IT staff to be hands off as well. So as far as possible, have the system look after itself, be able to balance the load automatically, be able to fail over automatically if a server dies, don't ask individuals to go and do something in an emergency, have the system look after the issues that we know are going to happen. Don't write policies into a user manual or a technical instruction guide, build it into the system and basically allow exception triggers, which we mentioned a little earlier in my presentation, exception alerts to come out that let your IT people focus on when things go wrong rather than have to sit and stare at network operation screens just in case they can spot anything go wrong. If you can do that intelligently and you can start seeing trends happen, it's a refreshing experience to see an end user get an outbound call saying, looks like you've connected more than three or four times without succeeding. Can you tell us what the issue is? And for the help desk on that outbound call to try and ascertain, is this education? Yeah, is it just user training that's wrong? Is it hardware? Is it you know, deliberate? Um, but it allows much tighter management and reporting from, uh, from the IT perspective. Almost every user has mentioned this one. Security in most people's minds either means I've got to constrain the business to be secure, I'm going to decide what you're allowed to do, and I'm going to delineate what you can't do. And from the end user's perspective, it almost always means I've had a bunch of extra stuff imposed on me that I didn't have to do before just because I've gone mobile. So immediately you've built an obstacle to your mobility project because now I've either got to go and train a bunch of people to do what for them would be unnatural extra behaviors or I've got to limit them on what they're allowed to do. No, you're not allowed to use these applications when you're mobile because they're not secure, they don't work well or whatever. Yet the security guys have a valid reason. They've got to protect the corporate assets um, they've got to protect the, cor the, the, the corporate assets and they've got to do that balancing act between either regulatory or corporate policy requirements and yet trying to achieve what the business operations goal is, total transparency. Break that down a little and what are the issues that we see? It's the way you authenticate, the way you log on. Don't impose anything different on them from the way they would do in the office. Don't tell them that they've got a VPN to use and he has a different VPN profile. That's not part of my job. Just let me work the way I work centrally today and do it without any encumbrance. And that's true for simple username, password stuff. It should also be true for the companies that have to use two-factor authentication, token devices, smart cards, certificate management, the infrastructure should be able to manage all of those and allow them to be used. Most importantly, if that connection drops, as it will through coverage gaps, don't force your users to log on over and over again. There's nothing more interesting than watching an executive coming down, as I did yesterday, from Chester by train to London, two-hour trip, and watching the guy getting repetitive strain injury on his RSA token as he constantly has to reauthenticate every time that cellular link drops as he comes down. The ability to just survive that and work for two hours from the one city to the other without interruption, that they can tolerate. I also want to be able to link, potentially, an individual to a device. And depending on the device they're on, I want to be able to decide what they're allowed to do. So this might be a personal device, 
and I'm going to have them not be allowed to access the following corporate applications from that device. This is an appropriate device to see, and I'm picking up from one of our speakers this morning, HR records. I will allow you to access the HR system from this particular device. So that relationship between individual and a device and bringing that down to an application level is powerful. Bottom line is, don't burden the end user with any extra steps. Try and achieve your security, your security implementation as seamlessly as possible, back to the same mantra, make it feel in the field the same way as it does sitting behind my desk in the office. Number 10, we're almost on the home straight. Again, this morning people spoke about stolen and lost devices. The ability to freeze the communications ability of a device at the click of a button and say you will not be able to communicate. So at least you've had that link back to the corporate trusted network frozen. We heard a couple of people worrying about the data that sits on the device. I would be as worried about somebody who now has a device that can hack their way seamlessly into my corporate infrastructure and start creating damage for thousands upon thousands of internal users and potentially my customers. So not just worrying about the device, but worrying about the ingress, the entrance into the corporate systems. Being able to then selectively, for instance, if you own any kill pill software, open up that tunnel and just fire the kill pill software down, which will neutralize the device. And to know that when you open up the tunnel that way, nothing else will transact over that tunnel. It's a very fine grained control, automated, that if you get that simple call coming in saying, I've lost my device, you can quarantine it. You then have the ability to choose, is it truly lost or has it been stolen? And if it has been stolen, then make sure the device doesn't create any harm to the corporate center. True for devices, as true for user IDs. If I'm going in for that ultimate, inter ultimate interview with human resources, for human resources to raise a flag with IT and to quarantine that username. So that if that person's gonna go back and try and find some way using their corporate credentials to come in, you can get proactive alerts centrally and maybe have a, a little deep and meaningful discussion about their severance pay and the relationship to, uh, to good behavior. So it's that ability to quarantine stuff and protect your network. Down to the last couple. We spoke earlier today about maybe people outside of your enterprise wanting to gain access to your enterprise assets. <coughs> it might be using a personal device, but if I look at one of our water company customers um, nearby, they use SAP as their job scheduling and transaction mechanism. They wanted to extend that out to subcontractors, but they didn't want to have to buy the equipment to do it with. And that project stalled for a while because you had this cost benefit argument going on inside the business of we'd like them to be tied to our systems because there's business operations benefit, but that means you've got to buy them laptops. Answer is, what if you can have that laptop come in and remember the earlier slide where you can then check that laptop for gold build standard? If part of your negotiation with that subcontractor was this device will adhere to the following minimum configuration, and if it doesn't, we'll automatically bring that device up to that standard. And at a detail level, by that I mean, I will install the following antivirus, the following anti-malware, I will block the following things as part of our corporate discipline, I'll make you um, subject to our web browsing rules or whatever, the ability for that subcontract, subcontractor on their first authentication to have a little message pop in and say, I'm configuring your laptop for access to our corporate systems, please be patient, and then as soon as it's clean, away they go and use it. True for subcontractors, true for private devices. And if you can do this successfully, now you don't need to limit those private devices to just look at email, calendaring, and scheduling. You can now selectively, by work style, by device, by user, maybe start conditioning that device to your standards to say, I'll start selectively rolling out applications to it. Especially if I've taken some heavy duty LAN applications that are proven through trials to, to work successfully on wireless, which maybe they didn't do before. Let me assume I've ticked all those 11 boxes. What you're typically gonna find is some other business area is going to look over the fence at what this business area is achieving and saying, 
and I want some too. And somebody else is going to start looking at it and putting their hands up. You've got to be ready to scale. Um, I'd be at a loss to pick the customers I look at. Um, let me go as far as I can from this room. New South Wales Police down in Australia. A thousand tough books in the vehicle using a legacy VPN. 200 police officers. I'll speak against myself, typically the younger guys, trying their utmost to make it work. 800 of them just came back to the IT department. <coughs> And the guys went back to two-way radio because the central office will do it. It was just too hard to use. Within two or three months of putting in the right infrastructure, all thousand are in use and deployed. A month later, there's a union meeting from 800 more people saying, and why are we, we, we being di discriminated against? Because we can't achieve our KPIs and those guys are. Get the right infrastructure in place. Be prepared that mobility may well start exploding. It could be home working. It could be facilities <coughs> management saying, I've now seen the ability to start selling some real estate in this pressured economic climate and letting much more people hot desk and work at home because I've now got an infrastructure that's secure and will work on cellular, it'll work on Wi-Fi. I don't need to worry about whether your broadband connection at home is secured because if I can get end-to-end -end encryption across that, I'll just roll out to that anyway. So the ability to have an infrastructure that not only achieves security, but will grow from 25 users to tens and tens of thousands of users as your business grows with that same rich feature set that we've just spoken about across all of them. My summary slide, if I take my little toy that I found in the attic and I start plugging in all those little holes for these challenges I filled, it gets a little easier for a dummy like me to get the silver ball down the bottom. Um, let me look at how that might look in reality. If I pick a day in the life, and I wake up in the morning and I fire up my laptop, and I'm going to fire up just the way as I do from home, um, I just happen to be a laptop user, I'm going to log on the way that the corporation dictates I should log on, whether that's just a username and password or some two-factor authentication. I'm going to have my device automatically scrubbed clean to make sure it has all the software on it that it should have, that it's up to standard. I'm then going to move away because my, day works, my day's work has started. My applications are going to stay alive even though my connectivity has dropped as I drive towards the local depot. I get within reach of Wi-Fi in the depot and I'm just going to connect automatically. As an end user, I don't need to do anything. It just works. And whilst I'm in the depot, I'm happily working away, and as I drive away, I'm going to roam across to cellular. And it could be a very poor coverage area. Um, I'm just going to work quite happily. I'm going to have an infrastructure that's going to be sensitive to the fact that I'm on cellular, and it's going to make much more careful use of those cellular connections. And if I drive into reach of another depot, even though I've got my UMTS or my, my GPRS ac connection active, I don't need to train my field engineer, please turn off GPRS because it's costing us money and then go to Wi-Fi. Just roam automatically to Wi-Fi. Leave the GPRS active because when I move away from that depot, I want you to be able to roam seamlessly back to GPRS. Have the infrastructure automatically pick the best bandwidth. <coughs> Provide tools for IT to actively monitor what's happening <coughs> if you need to. Provide logging facilities, as we spoke of, that will give you measurements by application, by network, by reconnects, by device. Provide policies sensitive to my location, to my device, to my network type, to my application, to my permissions, and have those policies run on the device, not at the center, because the device might not be connected, and I still want <coughs> those policies to be active. Also, have those policies not make the pipeline a democracy. Democracy is great, but not in the mobility world. I want to be able to dictate which application should have priority, which application should suffer when the network connectivity gets poor, and I want to be able to use this tunnel to enable things like streaming voice or streaming video so that I can take my soft phones that are currently running at the headquarters, my digital phones, and I can have those run as extensions when the people are at home. And I can do that even if you're living in a rural area with very poor ADSL or you want to run over a 3G card. And when I'm saying soft phone, it could be something as simple as Skype. But I just want to use that out in the field 
when the coverage is good enough to bring my mobile bills down and increase the amount of connection that I can get for people. That's my day in the life. If I can achieve that, I'm driving towards improved productivity. I'm giving a better life for the end user. I'm giving a lighter load to IT. So there's a productivity win all across. I've got end-to-end military-grade security. You might not need military-grade security in your organization, but if that's the level that can be achieved infrastructure-wise, why not have best of breed as an infrastructure to manage what you have, but have that security run in a way that's wholly transparent to your end users, and most importantly, gain detail, granular visibility and control over what's happening in that mobile space. Conclusion for that is, enterprise mobility could be an enormous costly drag anchor for the success of your project. Flip that round to the glass half full picture is if you can get that wireless environment to have an infrastructure that makes your applications, your users and your devices behave to the infrastructure as if they're sitting on the LAN, you have a much greater chance that a mobility initiative will succeed and you'll achieve those productivity promises that you hung yourself out to dry pitching to the board. I've tried my best not to quote customers and examples. If any of this looks interesting, pop onto our website if you don't like talking to us. It, it's, it's only software, so it's available for a free evaluation. So if you want to test whether I said it was true, kick the tires and see it for yourself. Or if you can stand to talk to us, our stand's just outside the door. Please come in and visit us. Thank you for your time. <laughs>